Hello and welcome everyone. We welcome you to today's webinar, Cancer Genomics, What We Can Learn from Africa. I'm Christy Jewell of Labyrinths, and I will be moderating today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you can share today's webinar on your personal social media. Just click on that social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on that support tab found at the top right of your presentation window, or you can use that ask a question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. Today's presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. At the end of our presentation, click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Timothy Rebeck. Vincent L. Gregory, Jr., Professor of Cancer Prevention, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Division of Population Sciences, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Rebeck. You may now begin your presentation. I'd like to thank the presenters for inviting me today to present about our work on developing prostate cancer research capacity in Africa. I'm going to highlight some of the genetics and uh, epidemiological studies that we have uh, formulated to uh, understand better how cancer, particularly prostate cancer, uh, can be understood better in Africa. And I'm going to use the example of the men of African descent and carcinoma of the prostate or MADCAP network. Uh, as a model for how this kind of work can be done. So why were we studying cancer in Africa? Uh, just a few uh, notes that uh, the cancer burden in Africa is anticipated to approximately double uh, by uh, 2040. Uh, the number of deaths, for example, will double. Uh, we uh, predict that approximately 1.4 million Africans will die of cancer in the year 2040. So this is a huge burden. In addition, we already know that cancer kills more Africans annually than malaria does uh, worldwide since about 2015. So while cancer is anticipated to rise in incidence and in death, malaria and other infectious diseases have dropped. So this presents a huge conundrum to ministries of health and other policymakers planning for disease in Africa, because they still have a huge uh, infectious disease burden, yet the chronic disease burden, particularly cancer, uh, is growing. And so we need to now start addressing uh, our understanding of cancer and other chronic diseases so that countries in Africa, policymakers, ministries of health will be able to uh, begin to uh, approach this burden uh, as they uh, uh, face the next 20 years. Another issue, uh, particularly with genomics research, is that most genomics research has been very limited in terms of the racial and ethnic variation uh, of the people who have been studied. So here's one piece of data from last year uh, that bring home the point that the uh, majority of genomics data that have been generated uh, from GWAS studies uh, has been in European descent populations with quite a bit of East Asian contribution. But if you look at the purple bar um, the, in the uh, left-hand piece of this panel, very, relatively limited amount of African data, despite the fact on the right-hand bar, Africa in purple uh, makes up a sizable proportion of world population. So we're really not getting to the point that we can understand particularly genomics but also epidemiological and clinical features of cancer and other diseases uh, because we really haven't studied them very well yet to date. 
one of the things that I'd like to bring home to you is that diverse research data uh, with, with respect to ethnicity and race across geographies is not only good and helpful to those populations that are underrepresented in research, but this kind of data will improve disease management for all populations. So everybody will benefit uh, if we can include diverse and underrepresented populations. So this is just one paper of many uh, that bring home this point. So this is a paper that studied genetic misdiagnoses and the potential to exacerbate or create health disparities. And what they did in this um, paper is studied um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so not cancer, but a disease uh, that has a genetic basis. And what they found is that in, uh, in many uh, early studies, <clears throat> certain variants it, uh, were uh, seen to be very rare in Caucasian populations, and they were inferred to be disease causative. Whereas when these were studied in black Americans, they were found to be fairly common variants. And so what happened is by not studying the full spectrum of uh, individuals uh, with respect to race or ethnicity, mistakes were made in terms of the, the inference about whether some uh, variant was pathogenic or not. So again, by studying diverse populations, we can inform genetics for the minority populations, but we can also create, uh, impede the creation and exacerbation of disparities and avoid misdiagnoses for all populations. So there's a lot of benefit to doing work that incorporates diverse uh, data, and particularly uh, because of the ex ex uh, high disease burden in African Americans uh, that we should be able to uh, learn more about how to address and understand uh, and generate knowledge about African Americans as well. So why study cancer genomics in Africa? I sort of alluded to this. Um, we've known uh, Pliny the Elder many hundreds of years ago told us that Africa always brings us something new. Um, and we know that by studying, uh, uh, developing data, developing knowledge, but also bringing technology and new tools uh, to a place like Africa, um, we can, uh, th this kind of work can be social and economic drivers and disruptors. We can leapfrog away from current, the current state of healthcare and healthcare knowledge uh, and, and uh, uh, health uh, services uh, sorts of activities uh, and disrupt the current pattern. Uh, we can foster innovation and investment in Africa. We can stem brain drain because many uh, talented scientists and clinicians leave Africa because the opportunities aren't there. Uh, we can address the unique biological features and phenotypes of cancer in Africans and African descent populations. And these things are becoming increasingly feasible due to lower costs and accessibility. So genomic uh, activities are being done uh, widely across Africa, and there's the opportunity to build these even further. So just with that little bit of background, I'd like to introduce to you the um, concept of a a, a worldwide consortium that we've developed uh, called MADCAP, Men of African Descent and Carcinoma of the Prostate, which was set up to link researchers in the United States and across Africa, as you see on this map. Uh, we have done that by receiving NCI funding and build, bringing in uh, researchers, uh, collaborators, clinicians, and a variety of different technologists across uh, the African diaspora to understand better prostate cancer, which is the example that I'm going to uh, illustrate today, how we've gone about doing this. So we received a, a UO1 grant, a grant from the NCI. And so what I'm going to walk through now is just to give you a sense of what it takes to build this kind of research in Africa, where the resources are relatively limited, the capacity is relatively limited, but it can be done. And so I just wanted to walk through what kinds of things anyone who is interested in building research in a low middle income country might want to think about. And then I'll present some data of the, some of the things we've done. So in the past five years, we you know, had to start up. We had to start from scratch getting uh, human subjects, IRBs, forms, protocols. We needed to pilot our work to make sure that it could be done effectively and accurately in the African setting. We had to accrual, accrue patients that took many years, has been taking many years, during which there's a learning curve uh, for everyone about how to make these kinds of things work. And now we're in the reporting phase, meaning we have data and we're starting to report out some of the things that we found. And I'll give you a little flavor of that. 
So what are the kinds of things we need to think about early on as we develop this work? The first thing is that in, you know, if you're used to doing research in Europe or the United States, you probably have all of the things in place. There are systems, there are uh, processes that are fairly well outlined uh, to do the kind of work uh, that we might want in uh, genetics, genomics, and cancer. But in Africa, these things may have to be developed, and much of it is already in place. But we do need to make sure we have appropriate systems for the ethical uh, research of in involving human subjects, IRB protocols, research consents. We have to think about the regulatory aspects, whether we are in compliance with government regulations and have in proper in interinstitutional agreements, which may or may not have been done before. We have to think about logistical aspects like supply chain. Where are the reagents coming from? How do you get them? How do you make sure that they are there when you need them? We'll have to have SOPs and protocols and QAQC met, uh, practices as well as success metrics to make sure things are working uh, as we hope and expect they will. And finally, we have fiscal governance and oversight, uh, compliance issues, particularly if funding, uh, government funding, NIH funding is involved, uh, conflicts of interest, and figuring out appropriate invoicing and payments. So again, many of the things that if you're at a, a U.S. or European institution, you take quite for granted, many of these things have to be set up. So if you're thinking about doing research and want to have extramural funding, building in time and energy in the right people uh, to create these structures is, is critical. So as I said, we had to, in our startup, do a lot of piloting. And we had some great partners in the early pilots uh, across our African centers, including people from the Broad Institute, the Center for Proteomics and Genomics Research, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And we had these partnerships build the piloting and the feasibility for work in Africa. We created a number of uh, videos uh, sort of indicated on the right how to de extract DNA from blood and prepare a DNA stable plate, for example. So we created videos. We create, had multiple um, uh, site visits uh, to allow this kind of work to be done across all of these centers in a consistent and um, appropriate, optimal way. Uh, so we began to pilot these data we, in our uh, startup phase where we would begin to think about how to accrue patients whether we had a pilot phase and we uh, did evaluations of how well it was working and then after that pilot phase had metrics to ensure that what we did improved the situation and, and we, we did. We, we learned that having a short pilot phase, learning from our mistakes and correcting those mistakes really made things work better. Uh, similarly, we had to figure out what the data collection protocols were and we needed to pilot those. So we started collecting data on various kinds of clinical, epidemiological, biospecimen, DNA kinds of um, metrics, everything that we needed to do the research. And we, through that pilot, generated final data collection protocols that worked in all of the African centers. We also needed to figure out how to sample share. Um, so we had parallel evaluations of the uh, biosample collection across all of the centers. These were sent to uh, the Center for Proteomic and Genomic Research in Cape Town, as well as CIDR, the Center for Inherited Disease Research in uh, Maryland, uh, and they did parallel evaluation through uh, quantitations, uh, running uh, standard uh, arrays like the UK uh, Biobank Axiom Array, and so we did these all to understand how we're doing, whether there are things there that we um, uh, needed to improve or learn from. So we did this and we learned through this pilot phase how the quality control call rate uh, worked between the different groups. We did analyses of race and ethnicity. So are we actually getting, uh, these are all African samples, are we getting uh, appropriate d discrimination using uh, ancestry informative markers to understand that the people that we think are South African or we think are West African in fact are. Uh, so piloting, understanding who it is we're studying with respect to rate, uh, ethnicity and tribe and, 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 and background, national background, uh, was a critical step in making sure we had uh, confidence in the data that we generated. So let me talk a little bit about some of the data that we uh, generated just to give you an example of the kinds of things we can learn and the kinds of things that might be valuable for uh, uh, improving our knowledge about genomics uh, and genetics in Africa. 
So one of the things we did is we began by integrating GWAS data with population genetic data. So we had uh, genome-wide association study uh, asso associations, HITs, in prostate cancer. We identified 26 prostate cancer GWAS HITs, uh, and we found 161 autosomal SNPs. Uh, at these low size. So these are things that were reported outside. These were reported from uh, European and Asian populations that were very clearly associated with prostate cancer. And we layered upon that some of the data that we had uh, from thousand genomes in our data. So the a backbone of uh, SNPs in African populations. And we looked at uh, 68 independent SNPs with known risk frequencies and odds ratios for prostate cancer that were identified from other outside GWAS. And we did a number of different um, steps along, uh, to understand uh, what the genomic pattern, GWAS, uh, uh, prostate cancer disease association pattern looked like, um, in, 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 and we could make inferences about uh, prostate cancer in populations around the world. So again, we're sort of starting with basic information about population genetics and uh, cancer, prostate cancer susceptibility, trying to understand what that might look like if we do, uh, went out of the standard uh, North American, European, and Asian populations and tried to make inferences in Africans. So here is one piece of uh, data that's a little bit hard to see, but uh, there are two panels here. On the left-hand side are our 68 SNPs, uh, the 68 SNPs that were prostate cancer uh, susceptibility low site. Let me just focus on one of these SNPs just to help you uh, focus in, uh, RS758430, a SNP that is associated with prostate cancer on chromosome 2Q37, but we don't know what that is. There's not a clear gene. There's not a clear function associated with these. But what we, the first thing we did using our population data was to understand what the impact of this SNP was uh, with respect to risk in African versus European populations. So what you can see on this left-hand panel, those SNPs, um, uh, with a, uh, we've measured there a, um, a genetic uh, score uh, that allows us to understand the relative impact of each of these SNPs in an African versus a European population. So those SNPs that are more likely to have an impact on risk in Africa are in blue, and the SNPs that are more likely to have a, an impact on prostate cancer risk in Europe are in gray. So you can see uh, from these uh, analyses, not all SNPs are expected to have the same impact on prostate cancer risk in all populations. And our SNP 7584330 appears to have a slightly greater impact on prostate cancer risk in African populations compared to European populations. On the right-hand side of this um, slide, uh, we did the same kind of thing, but we're looking at genetic risk scores in populations. And so the small um, uh, lettering that you see there, it's hard to read, is uh, populate the different populations um, from African to European to Asian populations. So we looked at West African in the black, East African in the blue, and non-African, European and Asian in the gray. And so based on our analyses, what you can see is we predict that this prostate cancer, this set of 68 prostate cancer SNPs conferring risk um, has a greater impact in West Africans, a slightly lower impact on East Africans, and a much less of an impact on non-African populations. So this suggests that the SNPs that have been identified, again, outside of Africa, uh, those SNPs appear to have some important impact that is population or region specific. And this sort of fits with knowledge that we have about uh, the risk of prostate cancer, which is a highly genetic disease in West versus East African versus non-African populations. So here's just one piece of data that was published a little bit ago. This isn't genetic data, but it is data about the prevalence of prostate cancer across different populations. And in this specific study, they evaluated the prevalence of prostate cancer in Ghana. So the, and that's on the right-hand side, the prevalence of pop prostate cancer in Ghanaians is higher uh, than in African Americans in any of the published populations in South Carolina, Michigan, or Missouri, and St. Louis, uh, and much higher than in U.S. Caucasians. So this tells us a couple things. So the epidemiological data about the prevalence of prostate cancer suggests West Africans, or at least Ghanaians, have very high rates of prostate cancer, higher than in African Americans, that we usually think of as the highest rate of prostate cancer in the world. Ghanaians, in fact, may have even higher rates. And we see from the previous slide that 
uh, that genetically we would predict that West Africans, probably including Ghanaians, are genetically predisposed to having higher rates of prostate cancer, higher risk of prostate cancer. So we're starting to put together a picture where the genetic load for prostate cancer risk is very high in West Africans. We see that the uh, prevalence of prostate cancer is very high in Ghanaians and West Africans. So we're starting to put together a picture to understand better the burden of genetic risk and of prostate cancer in a West African population, which is uh, suggesting there's something very interesting going on there uh, that will help us understand why Africans and African Americans may have such high prostate cancer risk. So we continued this uh, line of questioning and we asked about selection. So this is an evolutionary genomics question. And what we have on this slide is we sele uh, the selection in Europeans and that's on the y-axis. So if you're higher up on the y-axis, you appear to be under higher selection in Europe uh, versus uh, on the x-axis, uh, if you're further along the x-axis, you are more likely to be under selection, evolutionary selection, at each of these loci in West Africa. So each of the blue dots is a SNP, one of the million SNPs that we studied. And so you see there's a lot of variation. Some are very high, so highly selected, some are less highly selected. The black dots are the 68 prostate cancer SNPs that we have. And so we see that our SNP of interest, RS758-4330, is pretty highly selected, a very strong evidence for selection of this SNP in European populations, meaning something happened at this locus that uh, happened uh, specifically in Europeans. Something w occurred in Europeans at this particular locus, which we've already said before is a prostate cancer locus. So what might that be? So what we did is look, drilling down into this locus, 7584330, we see that that locus makes a dispro disproportionately large contribution to prostate cancer in African American men. And these um, uh, uh, CMS scores, um, this, this is metric, combined metric of selection uh, in uh, Caucasians versus Asians, Japanese or Chinese versus Yoruba uh, in Africa have very different patterns of selection. And so without going into a lot of detail explaining this pattern of selection, the inference we made of uh, all of this data that I just showed you is that our risk allele frequency um, is higher in Africans and that versus non-Africans. So Africans actually have a higher frequency of the allele causing prostate cancer. But the reason that this allele is so much higher in Africans is because of something that happened in Europeans, a selection pattern in Europeans. And what we learned is that this particular SNP is adjacent to a gene in linkage disequilibrium with a gene known as melanophyllin, which is a pigmentation dilution gene. So uh, that's very interesting because we're looking at a prostate cancer SNP selection in Caucasians who obviously have different pigmentation, lighter pigmentation than Africans. Uh, and there's a gene right next to this prostate cancer SNP that is associated with pigmentation. So we infer that the haplotype that protects against prostate cancer hitchhiked to a very high frequency in Europeans. So here's what that means. So on the left-hand side, you see there's a pigmentation maintenance allele um, in brown uh, and the prostate cancer risk allele in orange. And so there's a chromosome that has, is associated with dark pigmentation and prostate cancer risk. And there's a second chromosome that's a pigmentation dilution, which means predisposing to lighter pigmentation, uh, but also on the same chromosome, uh, a, a, no, a low risk allele. And what we can imagine is that as individuals uh, migrated out of Africa, the pigmentation selection for lighter skin uh, led to higher rates of this protection allele, whereas in Africa, there are higher rates of pigmentation led to higher rates of this uh, risk allele. So you can begin to see a story where we can begin to take genomic information. And this is an unusual situation because there's an evolutionary selection going on that's also associated with pigmentation and cancer risk. But you can see how some of this information can begin to help us understand why there might be genetic differences uh, between European and African populations that will help us illuminate the causes of high rates of prostate cancer in African Americans. So in order to take this a step further, we went to uh, uh, take the million and uh, so SNPs that we had uh, pulled out from the analyses before, and we began to develop tools that we could use in Africa to better understand this particular phenomenon. So we could begin to take uh, a, a deeper dive 
into the genomics of African populations. And we created in um, combination, uh, in collaboration with the Center for Proteomics and Genomics Research, Georgia Tech, CIDR, and Affymetrics at the time, uh, the MADCAP Africa array, which is now being made publicly available via Thermo Fisher Scientific. And so we developed this, um, and I won't go into a lot of detail on this except to say that um, the uh, Applied Biosystems Axiom uh, Genotyping Solution from Affymetrics, Thermo Fisher was the foundation for what we did using a two-peg design. We enriched the um, panel for uh, cancer loci, cancer susceptibility loci, particularly prostate cancer, but all uh, cancer susceptibility loci that were known. Uh, EQTLs that were associated with prostate cancer, markers that tagged African genome, uh, and we ensured that it had overlap with other arrays that had been developed in this array, range like Onco Array or the H3 Africa Array, so that we would be able, uh, if we use this array, to compare it to some of the other arrays that are out there. So we ended up with what about 1.5 million SNPs on two pegs. Uh, and again, I won't go into all the details of the, new, the markers, but there are uh, a, a, a pretty broad uh, uh, spectrum of um, these kinds of markers uh, that can be used for African ancestry uh, studies, uh, GWAS studies in Africans uh, broadly, but then if, with a particular focus on cancer uh, and cancer-specific loci and EQTLs known to be associated with prostate cancer. So we've designed this to be widely available uh, for a lot of purposes. So we also did an evaluation that was just recently published in Cancer Research to evaluate how well this MADCAP array did. And so on this slide, you can see uh, just one panel about the, that presents the proportion of SNPs captured, so an R-squared value. And in the brown bars are the common SNPs, uh, common, uh, common variants, uh, and in the uh, blue bar is the rare SNPs. And as you would expect, uh, we would ex hope to tag, or we would have designed this to tag the common SNPs better than the rare SNPs. But in fact, we actually are uh, tagging rare SNPs pretty well, uh, generally above 70, 75 percent. Uh, R squared. Um, and we did this using about 400 prostate cancer cases from Africa and 400 controls. Um, and we see that the African SNPs are very accurately computed, particularly the uh, common SNPs as we, we designed it to be. Um, and the, a high proportion in all of the populations that we uh, were interested in, as you can see on the left-hand side, all populations across Africa were tagged pretty well. Um, so this is a pan-African panel that should be good for use in populations um, across the entire continent of Africa. I won't go through all of these in, in detail, but you can see in panel A here uh, more about these, this uh, panel. That we, uh, the MADCAP array in blue in panel A does overlap with the H3 Africa and UNCO array panels, which allow us, again, to uh, combine data, to uh, impute data that um, across if other panels were used. We also found in panel B that the MADCAP array actually um, uh, ta tagged um, SNPs at a, uh, in, uh, all, across all populations at a better frequency, allele frequency, a lower allele frequency, meaning uh, more fidelity, more resolution than the other panels. So we feel that our, our, our um, array does a little bit better in tagging uh, SNPs across all populations than the Onco array or the H3 Africa array. Uh, and, and let me just talk about, move to panel D, uh, where we took the three panels and compared them and we looked at a genome, a genomic region that's associated with cancer at multiple sites. This is chromosome 8Q24, a region strongly associated with prostate and other cancers. And you can see we did a really good job, the MADCAP array being in blue, um, where you see the peak um, in, uh, sort of to the center left of this uh, panel D. Uh, we did a really good job tagging SNPs in this important cancer susceptibility region. Um, by having a very high density of markers around cancer regions that were important uh, for, for cancer. So we feel like we did a pretty good job building uh, the MADCAP array and feel like it will have good use uh, in a, num a wide variety of cancer and other disease studies in Africa. I just also want to mention that we also uh, showed that we can capture good population structure and share genetic ancestry among across Africa. So we looked just at the MADCAP center sites, and you can see that we've 
um, found that uh, we, the, uh, we distinguish populations really well. And in fact, we're able to uh, uh, identify pretty accurately uh, deep subpopulation differences across the different uh, African sites. You see in panel E, uh, we're comparing Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa. And as you can see, as we model more and more populations, we're actually able to make fairly um, uh, refined uh, distinctions between each of these populations, which again is going to be useful for understanding um, genomic ancestry uh, in Africa, but also in African Americans uh, and other African descent populations. Uh, when we want to study uh, ancestry as well as disease susceptibility. And finally, we looked at a divergence of polygenic risk scores. So we looked at the genes, uh, the loci, uh, 147 in this case, of uh, uh, prostate cancer loci that had been reported by Schumacher et al. in 2018, and we created a polygenic risk score. So a, a, just a simple uh, uh, additive score of risk across these 147 loci that was created by Schumacher, but we applied it in the, our population using the data that I just described to you. Uh, and you can see that um, the gray uh, uh, curve there is Europeans. That's the European population uh, risk score. And that you can see when we apply the same risk score in our African populations, that polygenic risk score is shifted to the right. Uh, and that suggests to us that even though this score was built on European GWAS hits and uh, prostate cancer susceptibility loci found in Europeans. So this doesn't include uh, prostate cancer risk susceptibility loci that might be um, unique to Africans or have different effects in Africans that we didn't detect earlier. You can see there's a shift that the underlying polygenic risk score is higher in Africans. And this is consistent with what I was showing you before that uh, African underlying genomic risk for prostate cancer appears to be higher than in European and possibly Asian populations. So we're finding some interesting patterns which are consistent with uh, African descent individuals having underlying higher uh, uh, risk, genomic risk for prostate cancer compared to Europeans. Uh, and we think we can take this information a lot further by, and better understand why African Americans and Africans have such high risk of prostate cancer uh, and begin to explain it by genomic differences that we identify in these populations. So let me just end really quickly with a couple of slides to say what we learned uh, by undertaking all of this work. Some of the lessons that we had that are uh, telling us about um, the, the, what you need to learn, what can you learn uh, by undertaking these kinds of scientific activities uh, in a place like Africa. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say there's a lot of opportunity in Africa. There are bright people, there are resources. It is possible to do interesting science in Africa. Uh, and so that's something that I think everybody should keep in mind, that it's a, an, a, a place of opportunity uh, for all kinds of scientific activities. And people should look at this as an opportunity to do good science and to do some new interesting work uh, outside of the, um, the comfort zone of places in the U.S. or Europe. So when we did this, we learned that it's really important to build some uh, success metrics. So we need to, you need to tie the goals of the work to finite, achievable endpoints uh, that have a realistic timeline. And this is true, of course, of all science, but you need to tailor this to the setting that you're working in. Uh, and so thinking about what the appropriate su success metrics are to build this kind of science in Africa uh, specifically is important and make it realistic and make it achievable. It's really critical to have institutional buy-in. So you need to have an influential local PI who cares about the work and is willing to make sure it happens. Um, we often say it's important to require co-funding or support by the local institution. So we need to have some kind of incentive for the institutions to be on board, to buy in. Um, and that's something that uh, institutions uh, may or may not have a, a historic uh, experience building research capacity. Some do, many do, but some don't. And if they don't, you need to think about how to get the institution uh, to actually uh, prioritize the ability to do this kind of work. And they need to then foster an academic environment conducive to research. So again, while many African institutions have research tracks and research uh, structures, academic structures, uh, 
they're not always like we have in the U.S. There may not be a tenure track. There may not be protected time for researchers. These are things that have to be uh, worked with an, uh, the uh, academic institution to see that they happen so that research can happen. There has to be governance. Um, there has to be a requirement that there's inv active involvement of st stakeholders, including financial and regulatory personnel, in addition to decision makers. This goes again back to the academic institution, ensuring that there's proper governance of funding of research activities. You need to leverage existing resources. So baseline resources and infrastructure are often available, but they may not be uh, in one place. They may be scattered around the institution or, or even around the city. There may not be a large genomics core, but there may be genomics resources, and you may have to bring them together. Supply chain is a major issue. Uh, supplies are not always easily available, or they're very expensive, or they're um, un unreliable. So negotiating access to reagents and supplies in Africa is a critical feature to keep the research flowing. It's important to have staffing continuity. We need to guarantee positions for funded and trained individuals. So again, this is an academic uh, requirement. If you have a researcher who wants to develop a long-term research career, they need to have a position that will guarantee continuity over many years. And you could make the same argument for project managers and lab techs and things like that. And finally, absorptive capacity. This goes back to the success metrics. Wh wh where are the bottlenecks? Uh, that are going to occur over time? How do you uh, find those bottlenecks so that the structure can absorb the kind of work that you're trying to build uh, and that you can build the appropriate workforce and in infrastructure? Not every system can absorb all of the work and all of the infrastructure requirements that may be needed. So th those are things to think about. So on that note, I'd just like to thank uh, an, a large number of people, obviously not all of whom I can um, acknowledge in my uh, in, individually, but this uh, clearly this kind of work involves a team effort. It's been very valuable to have this team effort, bringing people in from many different institutions around the world, uh, both to build this capacity, but also to understand how, from the local perspective, to do this kind of work and make it successful. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today, and I would like to open the floor uh, for the online questions. Thank you, Dr. Rebick, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now, we have lots of great questions coming in, so let's dive right in so we can try to get to all of them. Dr. Rabick, your findings show West African populations are at higher risk from prostate cancer relative to East African. What can you tell us about admixed populations, such as African American, et cetera, given migration patterns? Thank you. Well, uh, we are very early in understanding uh, the answer to that question uh, b because we have previously uh, seen in the literature some uh, evidence that uh, there's substantial admixture in African Americans uh, and that that ad admixture may be associated with having higher levels of African ancestry, may be associated with higher rate risks of prostate cancer. But most of the uh, tools that have been used, the, the uh, panels, the arrays that have been used, didn't capture African ancestry very well. So I think that a lot of the work that's been done to date in African Americans has really focused around uh, inferences made by uh, genetic panels uh, based around European uh, um, uh, genetic architecture. So I think what we're going to learn is as we refine our ability to uh, understand the African genome better, we'll be able to better understand if there are gradients between West, East, South Africa, et cetera, uh, and what the impact of those African contributions are to uh, disease risk in general uh, and the uh, 
uh, admixture that we know happens in has happened in African Americans with European and Native American populations. So the answer to the question is, I think we have a lot to learn. Um, I think that uh, having these African panels will uh, teach us a lot more about the African contribution, which I think has been missing or at least in, inadequate in the past. Thank you, Dr. Rebek. Though area is optimized for African populations, you mentioned good coverage of other populations as well. Can you expand on that? Uh, if you mean uh, uh, coverage of genomes outside of Africa, um, as you know, the um, African genome is uh, by far the most complex and diverse uh, of all populations. Africans were the ancestral or origin of all humans. And as a result, there's a lot more uh, genetic variability, genomic variability uh, in African populations, across, within and between African populations than you see in many other populations around the world. So, um, you know, the amount of genetic variability in the um, North American and native population is much, much smaller than you'd see in Africa. And so uh, there's, uh, uh, a, a need to understand this very rich and diverse uh, genomics of uh, that's, that's much greater uh, in Africa than in other places. Um, and by doing that, we'll be able to better understand the relationship of these this very complex genome with quote unquote simpler genomes like you might see in East Asia or in Northern Europeans uh, where uh, there's uh, significantly less genomic variability. So um, I think that the, having all, a deep information about all genetic variability is going to be really very important, and particularly, again, if you want to understand African descent individuals, African Americans, for example, uh, this uh, amount of genetic variability needs to be increased, or the, our understanding of it. I'm not sure if that exactly answers that question, but. Thank you. And you now my next question is two parts. Did you see bone, mar bone marrow failure disorders in Africa, genetically inherited or acquired? And did you see cases of MDS, aplastic anemia, or DDA? So unfortunately, because our study was really focused around uh, invasive cancer, but particularly prostate cancer, we didn't uh, uh, record occurrences of any of those disorders. Um, they do exist but we haven't systematically studied them, so I really can't comment on their frequency, incidence, or the characteristics of those um, disorders. Dr. Rebek, is there a possibility or a possible association with vitamin D and exposure to sunlight with prostate cancer in Africans, given the millennophile in chromosome two association? Yeah, I think there's two things to think about here. One is that um, the association that we observed uh, was really kind of a random thing. It, we didn't expect, uh, by having identified a prostate cancer locus uh, that was associated with prostate cancer itself, we didn't uh, expect to or look for uh, the fact that there was hitchhiking of that locus next to a pigmentation gene. And so we haven't really fo formally studied the role of melanophyllin uh, on uh, prostate cancer risk. Um, and so we don't know if that gene, it's, it, it, that gene, the melanophyllin gene, has anything to do with prostate cancer or, which I think is our real hypothesis here, the selection of melanophyllin uh, in lighter skinned individuals uh, was uh, drove the uh, and hit the hitchhiking of this uh, prostate cancer gene to uh, different levels of frequency uh, in different populations. So I think the first thing is um, our main hypothesis, I believe, is that uh, it was a selection factor with, related to, but not biologically causative of uh, prostate cancer uh, in, uh, in, in European or African populations but it was the hitchhiking, the evolutionary selection that, that drove the frequency of the prostate cancer gene, not the biology of melanophyllin or pigmentation necessarily uh, per se. Having said that, there is evidence that uh, uh, vitamin D exposure might be associated with prostate cancer risk. Uh, and that has been reported from epidemiological studies. It's not entirely clear whether that's the case. Uh, there is evidence of vitamin D metabolism, 
vitamin D receptors and other pathways related to vitamin D that might be associated with prostate cancer risk. And uh, of course, in Africa, it's quite difficult because vitamin D uh, levels are uh, predicted to be quite low because of the dark skin pigmentation, uh, sun exposure and generation of vitamin D um, through sun exposure in African and African American individuals, dark, darkly pigmented individuals, uh, is expected to be quite low. So it's not entirely clear how much that has to do with the etiology of prostate cancer uh, itself, but there is also evidence that uh, prostate cancer might be associated with vitamin D metabolism. So uh, two things to think of, you know, the, the selection evolutionary history at the locus that we studied, the potential that vitamin D might be linked to prostate cancer, but not a real clear line between a causative relationship of vitamin D metabolism, our locus, and um, uh, prostate cancer risk. So lots of work yet to be done to, to, um, to understand that relationship. Thank you. Is there a role of immunohistochemical evaluation in your research? Absolutely. So the first line of work that we've described, I just described here, is really the germline inherited uh, genetic variation. But we've also spent a great deal of time now developing uh, tumor tissue studies uh, and understanding both by, uh, immunohistochemistry as well as uh, uh, gene expression, uh, RNA uh, measures of various kinds, as well as uh, uh, somatic mutations in tumors. So I think all of this will lead, help us to understand the relationship of uh, biology in uh, prostate carcinogenesis and how it is perhaps related to more aggressive disease in African and African-American populations, uh, specific uh, management strategies, treatment strategies that might be different in these different populations. Um, but I would you know, emphasize that I don't think we believe that there are fundamentally different biologies uh, going on in different races. What we think is that the uh, manifestation of mutations, the frequency of mutations differ, and these result in different patterns of disease, but the biology underlying uh, prostate carcinogenesis is probably the same for all populations. Thank you. Now, Dr. Rebek, besides the genetics, do you think that environmental factors play a role in the incidence of prostate cancer, and what do you think those would be? So it's very interesting. Prostate cancer is unlike many other common cancers in that there have been almost no environmental uh, lifestyle kinds of exposures that have been associated with prostate cancer. Um, there have been lots of studies, lots of very good studies that have tried to identify uh, uh, obesity, diet, lifestyle exposures, uh, carcinogens, that sort of thing, and almost nothing has been identified consistently as associated with prostate cancer risk in terms of environments. Um, the main risk factors for prostate cancer are African descent, African American race, um, age, uh, family history, and uh, obesity for aggressive prostate cancer. Height is one that's come up. But of all potential environmental factors that have been studied, almost nothing has been, aside from the ones I just mentioned, really consistently been shown to be associated with prostate cancer. So that's very interesting because you would think a disease like prostate cancer uh, should have some uh, really common environmental causes, but we don't see them. Uh, it's not to say there aren't any, but we don't see them. And that's very unlike many of the other common cancers like lung cancer, where we know smoking is, is critical, or breast cancer, where reproductive and hormonal factors, uh, exposures are important, et cetera. Colorectal cancer, where diet is really important. Um, prostate cancer doesn't have any of those. Uh, in contrast, uh, the genetic contribution uh, to prostate cancer susceptibility is the highest of any of the leading cancers. So prostate cancer is at least very genetic in its etiology and not very environmental in its etiology. So a couple of things. One is, um, it is an opportunity for us to understand and study uh, Africans and, and prostate cancer environmental exposures or environmental exposures that might be associated with prostate cancer because this is a very different population with very different environmental and lifestyle exposures. Maybe studying Africa will give us the opportunity to identify some of these exposures that we haven't been able to find in other populations. Maybe, maybe not, but at least it's an opportunity. Uh, but I think that um, it's very interesting uh, to begin to tease apart some of these factors and understand why prostate cancer, among all major cancers, is unique. 
Thank you. We have so many great questions coming in. Our next question, please tell us whether it is possible to develop polygenic risk assessments for hypertension or heart arrhythmia. Absolutely. So those um, polygenic risk scores have been developed for many, many disorders, not just cancer, but for uh, uh, cardiovascular, psycho, uh, psychiatric disorders, diabetes, polygenic risk scores have been uh, developed in many, many settings, and they are, they, they are proving to be useful in uh, combining the information for lots of, uh, uh, where lots of different individual loci, each of which has small effects, uh, can be combined to understand the underlying genetic uh, uh, predisposition that an individual may have. And those can be applied in just about any disease where you can come up with uh, underlying uh, SNP uh, associations. What was the biggest challenge while gathering data for the study from places that are so underrepresented, unrepresented in research? Uh, you know, the, there are many challenges that um, are inherent to working in an, in an uh, environment where uh, resources are limited. But I wouldn't say, you know, I, I don't actually think of this as a, a in terms of the challenges. I have been incredibly impressed by the hard work and the dedication of our colleagues in Africa. They're absolutely amazing. They work hard, and in many cases, they don't get a lot of credit for this. They're not making a lot of money. Uh, they're not necessarily getting academic credit uh, because they're, I mean, they get academic credit, but that's not necessarily their job description. Many of them are clinicians who need to see patients, and yet they're incredibly dedicated toward um, be, making this work happen on their weekends and their evenings and in the, in, in, on the side. And so while it's a challenge because a lot of these uh, activities are not in the natural flow of the hospitals or the institutions, while there are a lot of challenges with respect to uh, logistics and governance, um, you know, the people and the ability of the people to be dedicated and to work really hard and to uh, make it happen really surmounts all of these these limitations and so i guess i think in terms of the positives the people who actually make it happen uh, and not in the negatives which all can be um, as, as in our experience overcome thank thank you now how will this data inform clinical trials going forward um, i think that you know clinical trials in africa are uh, challenging because a lot of the infrastructure not only the regulatory infrastructure but the clinical um, infrastructure to do, for example, a phase one trial where very intensive um, monitoring and, and um, laboratory uh, uh, activities may be required, uh, but also access to drugs. Um, so there's a lot of challenges of doing this in Africa, but I think that the main thing that I would say the, the research contributes to clinical trials is our understanding that uh, patients are incredibly diverse. Uh, the cancers that we're studying in Africans um, look different than the cancers we're studying in uh, American white populations, European populations. And so by understanding these underlying etiological differences as well as the characteristics, the molecular characteristics of tumors uh, in diverse African populations really helps us to understand that developing a clinical trial in a homogeneous white population um, is valuable, it's important obviously, but it's missing a lot of the important knowledge we may gain from doing a clinical trial when we exclude more diverse populations. And I don't even just mean African populations, but uh, Latinx, uh, African American, Asian populations uh, that are not as much part of clinical trials as the majority populations, at least in the United States. So increasing the diversity, our background knowledge of the diversity, informing um, our the need to address that diversity in uh, clinical research is something that I think we are, th this kind of research really makes us aware of and uh, motivates the need for a diverse uh, inclusion and accrual of clinical trial participants. Dr. Rebick, thank you so much for this Q&A session. We have time for one more question, but I do want to let our audience know that we had so many questions come in that we are unable to answer but we want to let you know that these questions will be answered via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. So to wrap, Dr. Rebick, how long will these cohorts be followed up in their life? Are there descendants to be tested? 
Uh, well, we hope uh, with uh, uh, adequate funding and, and uh, longevity of the investigators to follow these uh, uh, patients up and follow and, and pursue the research in a lot of different directions. So we have not yet really undertaken family studies, although we're starting to do that now. Um, we certainly hope to follow up the patients to uh, monitor uh, treatment outcomes and uh, mortality and, and vital status and things like that. So we certainly have uh, short to intermediate uh, follow-up uh, uh, interests. Um, but we really hope to expand these studies in a lot of other directions, including uh, more uh, biologically oriented studies, mechanistically based studies, and uh, interventional studies, particularly in the area of screening and early detection. One of the problems in Africa, of course, is very late presentation because of lack of screening. So we're certainly thinking about how to uh, implement screening strategies, which in prostate cancer have been very difficult and very fraught uh, in the U.S., for example. Uh, but is a great need in Africa. So I think the, the direction that we're taking these is really toward uh, using the basic uh, epidemiological and causation knowledge we're getting to prevent early detect uh, cancers and reduce mortality as a result. Thank you. And Dr. Rabbit, you know, I want to squeeze one more question in because this question has come in a few times. Is there an application process for the new centers that would like to join this initiative? Uh, well, email me. There's a, we have a, a website, uh, www.madcapnetwork.org. On that website is a lot of information about our, 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 our uh, studies. We also have a link below with an email address that people can contact us. We're very happy to have uh, collaborators join both as contributors to the science, but also uh, as our data become available. They'll, they will be made public. Uh, they will be shareable through a process that we have. Uh, the genomic data are all being deposited uh, on a, um, uh, you know, in a public uh, space so that people will have access to the data. So there are a lot of opportunities both to collaborate and in the future to use our data uh, for other uh, uh, studies uh, in, in a lot of different directions. So we absolutely welcome uh, collaboration and have people uh, visit our website and learn more and contact us. Dr. Revick, thank you so much for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labrads and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I do want to thank our audience again for joining us and for their interesting questions. We had a numerous amount of questions that we weren't able to answer. And again, those will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand and Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.